Well, good morning. It is good to see everybody here this morning. As David mentioned in the announcements, if you have not already picked one up and you want one, uh, we have gone back to having an outline available for you this morning for the lesson. It's on the pink sheets that are on the little table uh, in the back. You certainly don't have to have one of those with you, but if you want one to follow along, uh, that's a practice that uh, I think we've done the entire time that I've been here at Forest Hills. I, I think uh, probably within the first week or two, maybe even I was told uh, when coming down that you were kind of used to having an outline. My outline's a little bit different. Uh, having a few blanks to fill in here and there on just some comments to try to uh, maybe help people listen along a little bit and stay engaged in the lesson. Uh, we stopped that, of course, when we uh, didn't meet for a few weeks due to COVID and we met online. And when we came back, we hadn't really implemented the paper handouts again, uh, but I am planning to have those again every week. And as David mentioned, we'll be getting back into the practice of a, of a bulletin uh, type of a handout and, and have that there for you as well. And hopefully uh, that'll be beneficial, help our time being spent together be as productive as it can be. Uh, related to that, of course, last week we did not have our normal sermon study because we had the, the installation of our elders here at Forest Hills starting today, again, at least with this morning's lesson, uh, we will have a sermon study following the conclusion of our service this morning. We hope that you can stick around for that. Um, I don't have the questions printed out on the handout, uh, but we'll have some questions that we are discussing related to this morning's lesson, and you can make comments and add other things that I think are, are practical applications of the things that we discuss in our study. Uh, this morning, I want to spend some time looking at the book of Galatians. And if you looked at the handout, there are a lot of passages from Galatians that we're going to look at today, and there aren't any passages anywhere else. Uh, we're really going to spend some time going through Galatians. We're not going to go through Galatians in order. We're going to jump around a little bit and talk about different things that are brought out in the book of Galatians. But when we think about the book of Galatians, we probably all have a tendency to think of the warning that Paul gave in the first chapter and the amazement that he expressed in the fact that these Galatians had so quickly deserted the true gospel and were falling for a different gospel. That was in our scripture reading for this morning that Paul just states, I'm amazed that you have so quickly deserted that gospel that you've fallen for a different gospel, which Paul describes is not really a gospel at all. But there are some who are distorting the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're twisting it and turning it into something else. And you've been falling for this different gospel. And Paul was writing to them, encouraging them not to do that. Now, I do believe that this really is the theme for the book of Galatians. And it's that theme that I want us to examine this morning. However, embedded within that different gospel was a concept that's related to the age-old question of law versus liberty. And that's really what's most applicable to us today as we struggle with this idea of grace versus legalism and how do we follow Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be a Christian? What is our relationship with God based upon and what does it require of us? And in the book of Galatians, we can see the roots of the problem of legalism in the perverted gospel that was preached, a gospel that really found its foundation in Judaism. And that's really part of the problem that was presented here. It's out of Judaism that Paul says this originated. And I'm sure most of you are aware of the dangers that were posed by the Judaizing teachers of the first century. Paul talked about his own roots being found in Judaism in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. He says, Therefore you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism. How I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. And, and Paul begins by talking about his own background in Judaism, his roots in Judaism, and he wasn't ashamed of those roots. But he left all of that behind when he became a Christian. He says, in my former life in Judaism, there's a lot of things I did, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond any of my contemporaries. I was more Jewish than anybody that you could know. I loved our traditions more than anybody that you might know. I held to those traditions more than anybody that you might know. But he understood when he became a Christian that he had to leave those things behind. However, those who had perverted this gospel didn't leave it behind. Instead, they placed their emphasis on the role that was played by the law of Moses. And that's what they kept emphasizing 
Was this law of Moses teaching that the Gentiles had to keep the law of Moses if they wanted to be saved? The most obvious outward form of this was circumcision. And that can be seen in what Paul wrote, that emphasis on circumcision. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 3, he says, I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he's under obligation to keep the whole law. But, but the Galatians were being pressured by some that their men needed to be circumcised. They needed to be circumcised in accordance with the law of Moses. And he said, well, if you do that, then you have to keep the whole law of Moses. Of course, these Judaizing teachers would be fine with that. They wanted them to keep the whole law of Moses. Galatians chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. And here again he comes back and he says, whoever these people are, who are trying to persuade you to be circumcised, you know, they don't do a good job keeping the law themselves, but they want you to be circumcised in accordance with the law, and they didn't stop at circumcision. They taught that salvation was based upon the works of the law. That's part of why Paul asked the question that he asked. In Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 2, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And he goes back and really is talking about when they first became a Christian. I mean, when he says, did you receive the Spirit... We, we might use the expression, how did you become a Christian? Did you become a Christian by keeping the works of the law, or did you become a Christian by hearing with faith? That you heard the word of God and you believed it, and you accepted it as the word of God. Paul understood the danger in placing emphasis on these kinds of works of the law. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10, just a few verses later, he said, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. And what he was recognizing is if we are living under this law, uh, under the law we end up being cursed. Because under the law, if we don't keep every act under the law, well then we're condemned by law. We're found guilty. We're law breakers. And that doesn't bring us to having salvation. That brings us to condemnation. That this gospel message, as he talked about it in Galatians, was being twisted, was being perverted. And one of the reasons he says it's not a gospel message anymore, it's not good news, this is turning it into bad news. If somebody's coming to these Christians and saying, in order to be pleasing to God, you have to keep the law of Moses perfectly, that's not good news. Because nobody had been able to keep the law of Moses perfectly with the exception of Jesus Christ. No one was able to live under those conditions. It ended up being a curse. Everybody fell short in that regard. And so Paul warned the Galatians not to accept this kind of a gospel. In the first few verses that we read this morning in our scripture reading, after talking about him being amazed that they would fall for this different gospel, which really isn't a gospel. It's a perversion, a twisting of the good news and turning it into bad news. He says in verse 8 and 9, But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be a curse. And Paul's saying you, you, you should not accept any other gospel. If somebody presents a different gospel, a gospel contrary to the one that we presented to you, he should be accursed because it's not good news that he's bringing. It's enslaving people. It's causing people to fall short. It's showing them that they can't have a relationship with God. And I think most importantly and most tragically, it negated Jesus. And it negated Jesus' sacrifice. It nullified it. It made it of no effect. It wiped it out. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, Paul says there, I did not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. 
And when he's talking about this idea of being saved by law, you know, this negating Jesus Christ, because if it came through law, then you don't need Jesus to die. And then Christ died needlessly. I mean, he really kind of introduces at the beginning of that, it would nullify the grace of God. I mean, it, it takes grace away. Because if you could be saved by fulfilling the works of law, and not only if you could, but that's what you do, it's by keeping the works of law that we earn our way into heaven, then what was the point behind Jesus' crucifixion? Paul asks that question and says there really wouldn't be a point. The Hebrews writer, by the way, talks about this quite a bit, but we're not using Hebrews this morning, where he goes into the sacrifice of Jesus and why it was necessary. And, of course, the law couldn't achieve salvation, which is why God sent his son to die for us. But in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 2, Paul says there, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. If you receive circumcision, you're acknowledging that you're going to try to keep the law and that by the keeping of the law, you're going to have this relationship with God. Well, if your relationship with God is based on the keeping of the law, well, then Christ doesn't play a part in this, does he? He says that Christ will be of no benefit to you whatsoever. And in the most severe statement found in this epistle, in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 4, he actually goes so far as to say, you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. And tells these Christians that if you think that you can be justified by law, you've been cut off from Jesus Christ. You've fallen from the grace by which you stand. And you no longer have that relationship with God. And that's the danger that was faced by the Galatians. That was the perverted gospel that Paul says was introduced there. And yet, thankfully, Paul didn't stop there. He went on to explain what the true gospel was as well. The perverted gospel put its emphasis on the law of Moses. The perverted gospel found its roots in Judaism. That perverted gospel negated Jesus Christ. But the true gospel did have a relationship to the law of Moses. It had this relationship with the law. In some of the most direct passages in the New Testament, Paul explained that the law was there to lead us to Christ. And yes, Christianity in a sense grew out of Judaism, that there was this relationship with what was there before. But he says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19, the law, why the law was there, the law wasn't bringing about salvation in and of itself. He says, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. And he lays out there the case that the law was never meant to be permanent. The law was temporary. The law was not part of God's original arrangement with man. It wasn't even part of the promise that he made to Abraham. The promise to Abraham was way before we had law. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph, all those, that's way before there was a law. The law came in later. Why? He says, well, the law was added later because of transgressions. And it was meant to just kind of be a holdover. It was going to be in effect until the seed should come to whom the promise has been made, until the Christ would come. The law was meant to be in effect. In a few verses later, Galatians 3, verse 23 through 25, he says, But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Well, there when he talks about that relationship, you know, why did the law come? What was the purpose of the law? He says, well, it was meant to be a tutor. It was meant to be a guide. It was meant to be a schoolmaster. It was meant to point us to Jesus. But now that it has fulfilled its mission and accomplished its purpose, we are no longer under that law. Well, it doesn't mean the law doesn't still serve a purpose. The law is beneficial in teaching us about the thoughts of God, the ordinance of God, the idea of holiness and righteousness, living pure lives. But he says we're not under that law anymore. We are under Jesus Christ. We're not under a system of law anymore. We are under a system that's based on Jesus Christ. 
And he goes on to explain that our salvation is not based on works. Instead, it's based on justification by grace through faith. Not based on works. Not based on the works of the law. Not based on law keeping in that way. In Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 16, he says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus. That we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It goes on to say it's not by works of the law. Now again in his context, he's specifically talking about these works of the law of Moses. The keeping of the law of Moses, the circumcision, the everything else that went in with it. The Sabbath keeping, the sacrifices, the kosher laws, you know, the tithing, everything else that's there that was part of that system. He says that is not how we find our salvation. We don't find justification in those ways. Not made in a right relationship with God through the works of the law. Instead, it's faith in Christ Jesus. And when we believed in Christ Jesus, that we found a way to be justified before God. That the law cannot justify, the law only condemns. In Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 2, when he asked that question that we read earlier, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? He goes back to the beginning of their walk with God. Their conversion when they first became Christians. And he asked the question, how did you really become a Christian? Did you become a Christian by keeping the law perfectly? Did you become a Christian by being circumcised and keeping the kosher laws and the Sabbath laws and all the sacrifice laws, the tithing laws? Is that how you were introduced into your relationship with God? Or were you introduced into your relationship with God by faith? Now we could actually expand it from that and we will. When you're introduced into your relationship with God, do you get introduced into your relationship with God by being perfect in all that you do? I mean, do we have somebody who comes forward and says, I want to be a Christian, and we say, okay, but before you can be a Christian, you've got to get every aspect of your life right. You've got to fix every problem that was there. You've got to be living perfectly. I mean, when you become a perfect person, then you can become a Christian. He asks, is that what happened with you? And the obvious answer is no. That's not what happened with anybody. They heard the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They heard about God's love and that he sent his son to die for us and that God wants us to be saved. They recognized they were lost in sin. And when you come forward by faith, you really are throwing yourself on the mercy of God because God offers that. The grace of God where he says, I know you've messed up. I know you're not perfect. That's why my son died for you. And if you believe in him, and if you put your confidence and your trust and your faith in him, I'll save you. I'll save you based off of his righteousness. I'll save you based off of his perfection. They would know that's how they first came to Christ. And Paul's reminding them of that. And their conversion was not based on works. Their salvation was not based on works. Our conversion was not based on works. Neither is our salvation. In Galatians 5, 5 and 6, he says, For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. It comes there in Galatians 5, 5 and 6. It's our faith that's working. Our faith is working through love, and he'll talk to them about what our faith does and, and what happens as a result of that. And there are some works that will manifest themselves because of our faith, but our righteousness is still based on faith. What Paul says here is that this true gospel is about freedom in Christ. That's what he ends up saying. It's about freedom in Christ as opposed to the slavery. That comes from the law. This freedom that he talks about in Galatians 2 and verse 4. He says it was because of the false brethren who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty. Which we have in Christ Jesus. In order to bring us into bondage. He uses the word liberty there instead of freedom. 
But he says what they didn't like, it, it, you know, they're living by all these rules and regulations and laws, circumcision and all these things. And when they look at you, you're, you're living liberty in Jesus Christ. You have this freedom. You've been set free from the bondage of sin and death. And you've been set free from a system of law keeping. And they didn't like what you had there. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And he describes Jesus there. He redeemed us. And he redeemed us from what? He redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law was a curse. Law keeping is a curse. And he says Jesus redeemed us from that. He purchased us. He became the cursed one for us. He was nailed to that tree, nailed to that cross to undergo the curse of the law. The penalty, the punishment for violations of the law, breaking the law, not living up to that standard. And in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 1, he says it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. He set us free from this kind of system. Why would you want to go back to that kind of system? He set us free from the law keeping, from trying to earn our salvation by works. And that's what the true gospel is all about. And the reason that it's good news is because even in that initial message, it's saying that, you know, you're not going to be saved based on who you are. Because we all recognize that we are not good enough. That I don't have to be a certain way in order to get into heaven, or I'm never going to make it. That I don't have to live perfectly. That I don't have to do this thing. But Jesus did it for me. And that's why it is the gospel invitation. But that brought up another problem. The problem of freedom. And how we use our freedom, how we use our liberty, that can be a very real problem that Paul also addresses in this book. That we have been set free by Christ for freedom's sake, but we could use that freedom in a way that causes damage. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. And when he talks about being set free, he says, even though you've been set free, don't go too far in the other extreme. Even though we recognize that we are not saved by law keeping, by rule keeping, by doing everything perfectly, that you might go to the opposite extreme of legalism and just feel that you're free to do whatever you want to do. And that's what he describes here as turning it into an opportunity for the flesh. We studied this morning in Romans some of that, but again, we're going to stay in Galatians. And, and what he's saying here is don't allow that to happen. Instead, just through love, choose to serve one another. Through love, make choices in, in trying to be the kind of people that you're supposed to be. And, and the end result, of course, of this type of thinking, he said in Galatians 5 verse 15, you know, if you turn your liberty into opportunity of the flesh... He talks about biting and devouring one another, being consumed by one another. That if we just let loose, well, that's not going to end well. If we say we're living under freedom and liberty and we don't have a system of law and we can do whatever we want to do, he says that's going to destroy each other. You're going to bite each other and devour one another and consume each other. And this worldliness will consume the congregation of the Lord's people and you won't exist anymore. But instead... If you, through love, serve one another, that will take a different approach. And what he goes on to describe is the old struggle of the spirit versus the flesh. That there is this spirit and there is this flesh inside of us. And although we're not saved by the works of the law, that we need to understand this battle inside of us. In Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17, he says, But I say, walk by the spirit. And you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit. 
and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You know, when he's talking about this system of works of the law, and this system of walking by the Spirit, and living in freedom. You know, he says you do need to avoid giving yourself over to the flesh. You do need to avoid those things that there are laws against. And that when you live by the flesh and you engage in those kinds of activities, yeah, you're going to be condemned. There are laws against that. But if you walk by the Spirit, and if you're pursuing the things of the Spirit, and you find things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You know, as you pursue those things, you won't find condemnation. There's no law against those things. The more you love, it just manifests itself in more and more love toward one another. The more you walk by the Spirit, the more you find that peace, the more you find that joy. You can grow in those areas and you can continue to advance in those areas and you don't have to worry about stepping over any line and finding yourself in violation of God's law when you practice the things that you're supposed to be practicing. But the only way to win this battle is to be crucified with Christ. And that's what he describes in Galatians 2.20. That we must be crucified with Christ when he says it's no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. You know, we oftentimes look at that crucified with Christ part. I don't know how often we look at the living in the flesh. You know, I'm living in the flesh, but I'm living in the flesh by faith. I'm not living in the flesh by law. I'm not living in the flesh by these other works. I'm living in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And because he loved me and he gave himself up for me, then I give myself up for him. When he talks about being crucified with Christ, what is it that has been crucified? That life that's been crucified. He comes back just uh, later in Galatians 5 verse 24 and he says, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So what is it that I've crucified? I've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's what I've given up of who I was before. And in Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 14, May it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. But he has three times there where he talks about being crucified. I've been crucified with Christ. You know, I've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The world's been crucified to me, and I've been crucified to the world. That's what's changed. And how we handle our freedom. And that's the message that Paul gave the Galatians. I mean, they were being pulled, I think, between legalism and liberty. And they had some who come among them, and they were perverting that gospel, and they were turning it into this legalistic system of works by uh, you know, salvation by works, the works of the law. But then there were others who might pull them the other way and say, no, you know, just use your freedom however you want to use your freedom. Well, we face the same struggle today. And just like those early Christians were in danger of falling into a system of law, that we sometimes are pulled toward a system of justification by works. That we sometimes are pulled towards a legalistic mindset, a legalistic attitude, where we do have a tendency to look at Christianity as a set of rules. And that if we don't live perfectly by those rules, then we're not saved. That we're not really Christians, that we're not really followers of Jesus Christ. And if we do that, we forget that we're saved by grace through faith and not by works. 
I mean, how is it that we became a Christian? We didn't become a Christian by being perfect. We became a Christian by accepting the free gift of God, believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, being willing to give our lives over to him. And that walk as a Christian continues in that way from that day forward. It doesn't change immediately after we're baptized. For from that point forward, we have to do everything perfectly every moment of every day or we're no longer a Christian. That we're no longer one of his children. That's not how it works. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 9 through 11, he says, but now that you've come to know God or rather be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I've labored over you in vain. And I know, again, there is a particular context there in Galatians. But the point that Paul is making is you didn't get saved this way. You got saved by grace through faith. And God extending his gift to you. And then once you came to know God, you're turning this around and you're trying to earn your salvation through some other system. I fear for you that perhaps I've labored over you in vain. When he comes back in Galatians 5 verse 4, you've been severed from Christ. You were seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. He says there are some who will do that. They become a Christian and then they forget it was by God's grace and mercy that they became a Christian. And they try to earn it on their own through their own self-righteousness. But many more turn to the other extreme and believe that our works do not matter. Because Christianity is not a set of rules, some will turn that freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. And oftentimes that's argued, look, we're all broken people. We're all sinners, we're all weak, we all fall short, and therefore, I'm just going to live the way I want to live, and I thank God that I can do whatever I want to do. And Paul argues against that in this book as well. Remember in Galatians 5, verse 6, he says, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. Well, your faith has to be working. Your faith has to be working through love. It has to be manifesting itself in that way. And he says that is what matters. It doesn't matter whether you were circumcised or uncircumcised. What matters is do you have faith and is your faith manifesting itself in love as you're working in this way to serve one another and to serve the Lord? In Galatians 5, verse 13 and 14, he says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, but do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, see, he still comes back and says, you do have to fulfill this. But you know the way you fulfill it? The way you fulfill it is by loving your neighbor. If you practice love, then that's what God wants from you. If your faith is working through your love, you believe in God, and you're doing what's best for God, for other people. He says, that's what I want you to do. That's the gospel that I called you to. And really, that's the lesson that Paul wanted the Galatians to learn. And we're no different from them. We do have to recognize that we're saved by grace through faith. And we have freedom in Jesus Christ, which we're thankful for. But we have to use that freedom to serve God and to serve our fellow man. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, Paul says there, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. He says, I do want to tell you, where you put your emphasis and where you put your focus matters. How you choose to live your life. If you're giving yourself over to a fleshly pursuit, that's not going to end well for you. But if you're giving yourself over to the Spirit, you're going to reap eternal life. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. He describes that. When you became a Christian, what did you do? You believed in God. You realized your own weakness, your own sinfulness, 
your own failure. You recognize Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You are willing to repent, which is just turning back to him and acknowledging, I'm not going to try to live my own life anymore. I'm going to let you direct my life. You were baptized into Christ Jesus. It says that's when you put on Christ. And from that point forward, you know, the, the really easy part is all you have to do is continue to have faith and serve through love. Let that faith work out in your life, that that becomes the most. And now every step from this point forward is I'm just going to try to live my life the way Jesus would want me to live it. I'm going to try to let Christ live in me. And that's the basis of the decisions that I'm making. And if I'm doing that, that's what the gospel call is. And we must never lose sight of that. I sometimes tell people when they come forward to be baptized, I mean, that's the promise that they're making. Oftentimes, somebody who comes forward to be baptized, they may not even know that much about God's word. They may not know that much about being a Christian. They know they're lost. They know that Jesus is the Son of God. They know that he's their only way to come back to God. And they know that they're just promising to live their life as they study and learn from the scriptures what Jesus would want them to do, what God would want them to do. That's all we need to know. And that's how we approach that in our service to him. And if we can help you make your life right with God this morning, that's all that's required of you. That you're willing to surrender it over to God. That you're willing to let him have control. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have everything straightened out. You do have to be committed to living by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, walking by faith. That you're no longer going to pursue the things of the flesh. That you're going to pursue the things that God wants you to pursue. But if you've made that determination, God's grace will save you. His mercy will cover your sins. He'll make you his child. And he'll help you every step along the way. And we'll help you too. If there's anything we can do to help this morning, if you're ready to put on Christ in baptism, if you need to confess sins, need the prayers of the saints, anything we can do to help you spiritually, please come forward. Let us know how we can help while we stand and sing the song that's been selected.